Welcome to our lecture on Spiral of Silence, and this is uh, the last of the media theories that we're going to be covering in here. Um, and so, um, I think you'll see that this, this uh, theory gives us a little bit of a different kind of approach to understanding the media's relationship with the public than what we've gotten in our other media theories up until this point. Um, and also, this is not an incredibly difficult theory, and so um, I... I doubt this is a lecture that's going to take too much time, especially if, if uh, uh, listened to in conjunction with, uh, with the book. Now, what the spiral of silence is really interested in is the idea of public opinion. Um, what is public op opinion? Public opinion is the um, views that a person can reasonably express without fear of um, feeling isolated. So in the chapter, um, and, and Elizabeth Nolman um, who's our theorist who developed this, talked about what they call a plane or a train test, where if you found yourself sitting next to someone um, that you didn't know on a plane or a train, what are the kind of things that you would feel comfortable talking about? Right? What are the, the, um, the issues that, that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't be anything to be worried about, right? And so, so you think of really like hot topic issues that we might not address in those situations, right? You might not talk about your views on abortion, for example, or your views on religion in that situation. Um, and um, public opinion also moves on to like news stories, right? Particularly in politics. And Nolman was really interested in, um, in, pol in opinion as well, or in um, po um, a political opinion as well, and the ways that we often get ostracized about our political opinion as well. So similarly, you know, sitting next to a train or a bus, right, you might not say whether or not you're happy with um, the job Barack Obama is doing at, at this moment, for example, because that's something that's pretty divided within our country, and you get a good sense that you might get in, in, in an argument with someone over that. It might leave you, um, leave you being isolated. Um, and Noel talked about this, uh, what she called a sixth sense, right, where we don't only have this idea of what counts as public opinion, what we can and can't say and not be isolated, but we're also really good at kind of taking the temperature of the country, where we tend to have a sense of what kind of opinions are and aren't likely to be within the um, uh, within that feeling of isolation, just intuitively, right? Um, and so. Um, she thinks that um, right, when swings occur, for example, when swings occur in the country, they tend to be felt everywhere, even if you don't necessarily feel the, the swing. Um, people are really good at gauging which politicians are going to win, even in really close elections, for example. Um, and interestingly, right, this maybe throws a little bit of doubt on things like polling, for example, um, right, that those kind of methods of gathering information about the public don't really do a good job because they don't take into account those kind of sixth sense. So the spiral of silence refers to this increasing pressure to conceal views that are outside of the public opinion. So those who are, have marginalized views, views that are outside of the public opinion, tend to be quiet about their views. And that's what kind of motivates this spiral of silence. Now, it's this fear of isolation, um, right, and, and this theory takes into account the fact that we're really social animals. We're social animals and we've developed language primarily so we can be social, um, right, and, and so um, expanding our networks is one thing that we're constantly trying to do with, uh, with our communication and with language, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things that if we fear being isolated, we actually, um, might, we, we're likely to conceal our opinions. Now, they do this experiment where, um, they do is they, they get these really obvious mis uh, mistake, right? They draw, um, several lines, right, at varying degrees, and two of them are the same, right, the same length. And then they get someone in a group of, a room of people, and one person's a ringer, most people are in on it, and they ask the group, they say, which line here um, is different than the others, for example, right? which is a different length. And everyone in the group says a different one, right? all the same one. And you get one person right, who doesn't know who, who the obvious answer is staring them in the face. And there's all this group pressure. And um, there's actually videos of this on YouTube. You, you can, um, um, of this experiment, you can, you can um, YouTube these. And what end up people, you see people agonizing over it, but after a while they will concede. They will say, okay, that line is shorter. Just because of the sheer group pressure and that fear of isolation from the rest of the group, everyone else is saying that the line is different, um, that a different one is different than what's obviously true. 
Now, what Noel says is that media really accelerates this spiral. Since we all kind of get information from the same place, um, right, marginalized opinions become more and more marginalized. Public opinion becomes more and more monolithic, is what she said. We become more of a culture that seems to have one voice, one public opinion. And we use this example of a spiral because what it does is, um, if you take an issue that's, um, where there's likely to be a marginalized opinion about it on the outside, right, um, what happens is, right, the, the people who are a little bit on the out, outliers there might be willing to voice their opinion, right, but, um, or might be willing to be silent, but those on the outside won't be, right? But what the media does is it creates this kind of monolithic culture by getting those who are close to the borders of public opinion to be quiet about it. Well, what that does is it kind of moves the center then, right? And those voices get subsumed within it. Well, then, so what happens is what it, public opinion moves, and there are new people who, right, are on the outside, right? Public opinion is growing. Um, and so there are new people who are right on the outliers, people who might have been radical before, and they kind of get subsumed into it. And it becomes this kind of snowball effect, whereby the media makes us as one people, right? One monolithic culture that, like, America thinks this, um, as opposed to really taking into account our, um, our individuality. Now, Noel does talk about a group of people who are not influenced by the spiral of silence, and those are the avant-garde. You may have heard of the avant-garde in regard to art before, right? We talk about avant-garde artists, which means artists who aren't concerned with what everyone else is doing. They do their own thing. Now, the avant-garde people are the people who don't care about the isolation. Um, they're the people who see isolation as a price that has to be paid for... Um, uh, for holding their opinion. They're not influenced. These are the people who sit atop the spiral and the people who actually motivate public opinion. Now, if we think of um, right, people who might uh, fall within the avant-garde, people who really don't care what other people think, but they speak what they see to be the truth, right, I think of someone like Rush Limbaugh or Ron Paul or Bill Maher or Ann Coulter or um, Michael Moore, for example. Right? These are the people who are either hated or loved within certain circles, and they don't care, right? And they sit atop that spiral, and they motivate it. Now, the irony here is that right, we're often so concerned about isolation, and those are all the people that we're drawn to. The people that we're drawn to and who don't get isolated are people who speak their mind. Those are the people that we really admire. Um, and so often, um, right, like the very thing that those avant-garde people don't care about, that isolation, is a thing that they're able to avoid because of their ability to really um, subsume this and to sit atop that spiral and really set the public opinion. So, now this is a um, an objective theory, and you know that because experiments were used, and we're talking about cause and effect. The media causes this thing to happen. So. Does it give us an explanation of the data? Well, they use experimental data, and it does ring true, right? Experiments yield this. I also think it kind of has a sense of truth in our own lives as well. I think especially in college, often a spiral of silence happens. People don't want to, dis students don't want to disagree with the class, or often they don't want to disagree with the professor for fear of a lower grade, right? So maybe we, we know this a bit intuitively as well. Prediction of future events, it says, right, that the culture is going to become increasingly monolithic and that the um, right, public opinion is going to become more and more centered. A hypothesis that can be tested, clearly, because we had experiments where they did test hypotheses. Um, relative simplicity, I think, is rel uh, very relatively simple, right? We're able to breeze through this in, in under 10 minutes, so. And finally, practical utility. I hope so. I hope especially that stuff with the avant-garde might uh, challenge us a little bit to think about our own relationship to public opinion and, um, and what we're going to do with that, so. All right, good deal. Uh, I told you guys this would be a short one. See you all next time.